So, hello everybody. And as I said, I'm going to talk, give, give a brief introduction to today's subject matter. The focus of today's seminar is on the research and development of processes that will be required to bring a vaccine to market. They start here with the science and the discovery. It goes all this way. And at some moment, eventually they will reach manufacturing. Manufacturing, if we are talking of a vaccine or a biopharmaceutical, starts with the growth of your cells or your bacteria. And then at this stage, if your vaccine is a viral-based vaccine, you may have another bioreactor down here where you will grow your viruses and you will maybe infect this bioreactor, or you may have a vaccine that it's a subunit vaccine and all your stuff is going to be grown here. But then in any case, after you grow your stuff, you are going to go through a series of operations that are called in uh, altogether like uh, downstream processes. And these operations, basically what they do is they get rid of all the cellular machinery that you have used to produce your biologically in the first place. So upstream, grow your cells. Downstream, get rid of all the cellular things that you do not want in your product. You basically want to have your product 99.99% pure but then also very important, you want to have your product with biological activity. And then as in any process that has many, many steps, you are going to have loses of your, of your product as you go along. And you obviously want to maximize, you don't want to lose a, a product, you want to get maximum yield when, when you go through this. And this, I borrowed this slide without permission. I'm not quite sure if people who did this slide are in the audience. If they are, thank you. Maybe Cameron, I don't know if you did it. I don't know. Okay. So in my next slide. Okay, so after you finish that process, you will get what is called the bulk or the active product ingredient or the drug substance. And then this may be shipped to somewhere, to some other plant, somewhere else in the world. And this is going to go through a series of steps where you're going to go through filters, basically, and very importantly, it will go through a 0.2 micron filter. You want to make sure that your biological product is sterile, okay? At this stage, you may add other stuff like adjuvant, excipients, etc. This is called the formulation stage you may lyophilize, and then eventually you get your final product or drug product, okay? So here you have a number of conditions that uh, are going to vary. You, it may be frozen, it may be a, go at a fridge, room temperature, et cetera, et cetera. So 24 years ago, there were some two professors, two researchers, <laughs> University College London, one of them, you see that's now called Pavel Shamlo, is the very same person that is here. He and Peter Daniel, they were uh, chemical engineers by training. They realized that the biologicals that were coming through the pipelines, that the, they were at that stage in the discovery labs, they had some characteristics that would make them very fragile and very uh, difficult to process in some of the equipment that was the traditional ones in those uh, use in, in the chemical engineering industry. And they realized very importantly that miniaturization or traditional scale down, looking at geometrical scale down, would not give you an indication on how these mo uh, biological molecules were going to behave in the actual manufacturing process. And when you are doing uh, research and development of these processes, you need to be able to try and test. And these uh, items of equipment I mentioned can be very, very large indeed. They can be 5,000 liters, 10,000 liters, <laughs> and you obviously are not going to be able to experiment at that scale. And then you may have pilot plants where you have 
items of equipment in the order of 50 liters, 500 liters, but again, that is quite a large volume. So key items of equipment are bioreactors, centrifuges. The centrifuge is the item of equipment in which you would harvest your cells, you will get a supernatant, and then you will get your your product maybe in the supernatant or maybe it would be within inside your cells. And then the other important unit operation is filtration. So uh, Parvis and Peter came up with this idea that they could mimic the engineering environment within these items of equipment. And for that, they would look at the hydrodynamic stresses. Pavis, you can come in if I'm not saying the correct thing. <laughs> yeah. So no, perfect. Mimic you are perfect. The, you, you can mimic the stresses that these biological mo uh, molecules will experience as they go into these items of equipment. So these small devices, they call ultra scale down tools, and they could be as small as 50, mill 50 milliliters, 20 milliliters, 10 milliliters. So I was very lucky at that time, 1996, I joined the department and I was very privileged, very lucky to have both Parvis and Peter as my directors, my supervisors, mentors, and then friends. And I was, I think, one of the very first people in the world to test this, yes, with biologicals, with vaccines, with what was then considered to be the vaccines to come in the next 20 years. And uh, as a side project to this, so this started to generate lots of samples, I could have fun developing analytical methods that would cope with the analysis of this, because these was, were devices that were uh, predicting what was going to happen in the process. So we have lots of data and we had to do the analysis in a quantitative way and also uh, in a way that could be automated. We had uh, one of the first liquid handling devices in an academic setting. So if you want to have, you know, the, it's the dream of anyone working in the lab to have a little robot to do the pipetting for you, but then you need to have a method that can be automated. So to make a very long story short, uh, these uh, little ultra scale down devices allowed us to look at the process as a whole process, yeah? Not just to look at independent units of operation. And that was very, very key because each item of equipment or what you do in one operation will impact downstream. So a classical example is that all the processing scientists that work in the fermentation stage, they work like crazy to improve the titer here and then sometimes they improve the titer and the cells become very fragile. So when you do the harvesting stage, your supernatant gets all filled with chromosomal DNA, other things that will impact here. They will make you spend lots of water, lots of filters, etc. And so what you gain here, you lost here. And maybe that process is more inefficient than the other one. So the ability to look at the whole process and to look at interactions and to go down and to go up again and iterate, that gave us a competitive advantage to the people that were uh, collaborating with us. At that stage, we started to collaborate with many biotech and biopharmaceutical companies in the UK, and then also with um, some startups that were at that time in London or Cambridge or Oxford. And then uh, I know that in the audience, we have some uh, many, many bench scientists that some of those, some of you have startups. And I'm going to say something that I want to make it very clear. The process for vaccines and for biologicals defines the product. If you cannot have a scalable process, you will not have a product. And then I have a very nice uh, story about a startup in London, but I don't have time today, but I leave that as a curiosity for my students yeah, they asked me, and I love telling the story about Biobex. I'm just going to say that Biobex was a startup from the virology department in UCL. And mm -hmm. then fast forward, a few years later, was sold to the giant Amgen, A-M-G-E-N, the most important biotech company in the world. And then somehow this little company 
had some contact with Pavis very early on in the development and Pavis convinced them that those crazy um, cancer vaccines was that they were doing, they could be as crazy as they wish, but they had to look at the processing of those vaccines. And then uh, the story ends very, very quickly that uh, these vaccines were the first approved to treat cancer by Amgen a couple of years ago in 2018. Mm -hmm. So uh, very moving very fast now. This is a paper we published in UCL back in 2005. And these tools I described allowed us to look at um, what would be the issues for scaling up, scaling up very, very quickly vaccines in the context of a pandemia. Uh, in, the, in that uh, moment, it was H1N1. Peter Daniel um, died in 2009. And even a couple of weeks before he died, he was still pledging the government and the press that vaccines were the solution to save lives and also to save what he called fragile economies. Mm -hmm. Moving fast forward 14 years, we see this is a vaccine paper that was published in 17th April 2019. And you see here that the author, Tari K. And this is a surname I could never learn to pronounce in 20 years, but I'll try to say it now. Mukupuda. Hi, hi. Tarid, is that kind of correct? Masterful, masterful. <laughs> <laughs> so coincidentally, you see here this name, and this is the person that, that we are very honored, very privileged to have in the, as a guest speaker today. So now I'm going to tell the you are a bit about Tari. Tari joined University College London in 1998 to do an MEng, and when he finished his MEng, he said he will stay to do a PhD. Great, Tari. He wanted to do a PhD with vaccines, and so uh, Parvis was his supervisor. I was his co-supervisor, and Tari had a very beautiful uh, PhD project with um, the Health Protection Agency. In fact, he was so capable and so bright that he had two PhD projects at the same time. He was looking at, he was looking at meningitis vaccines and also uh, because at the time there was these uh, terrorist attacks, uh, he was looking at anthrax vaccines as well. So at one point, uh, uh, Tarit felt uh, he was already quite independent and he could let his supervisor and beloved professor go to the, to the USA. So he <laughs> let Travis go to Eli Lilly. And from one day to the other, I became Tarit's supervisor. <laughs> we had fun. All this was getting momentum. We were getting projects. And uh, at that time, we were the UK IMRC, Innovative Manufacturing Research Center for Bioprocesses. We were having students and grants, etc. But then a couple of years on the road, I was going to celebrate my 10th year anniversary in University College London. Um, I went there for a one year fellowship. And so it was high time I could return home and Tarid was already very, very independent and said he could manage without Pavis, without me. And he said he would stay for a while in the department. But if you do your maths and you say 2019, and this is the University College London, he kind of the while he stayed for quite, quite, quite a while there. And then that's the introduction for Tarit. And quite recently, I think after 20 years in college, he thought he could see if there was life outside in the universe outside UCL and he crossed the ocean to go to Merck in the USA. So Tarit, now I will um, share the, let you share the screen. I think that's, a, that's the, my last slide. Let me see. Oh, no, 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 Tarit. There's a handwritten <laughs> note here. Shall I re read it? Go read ahead. It out to you. Go ahead. Yeah? Yeah, it says Buenos Aires, 16th July, 2020. Yeah. Dear Tarit M, may I take this opportunity to remind you that English is our second language. <laughs> Please speak slowly. <laughs> that was always my British, problem. <laughs> yes, 
<laughs> use your standard British accent pretty much. Also ask the audience to use the chat box to write down any questions they might have. Um, and one more thing, try not to use acronyms. <laughs> Remember, DSP stands for downstream processing, GMP, good manufacturing practices, blah, blah, blah. Yours truly, I do not know the signature, I cannot read properly. Okay, <laughs> over to you, Tariq. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Susanna. Okay, so let me see if I can share my screen. And in doing so, let's see if we can bring up this presentation. So move into presentation mode. So hopefully you can see my slides now. Yes. Perfect. Great. So uh, always a great pleasure to be bullied by your former co-supervisor and supervisor <laughs> to giving a seminar presentation. But uh, I have to say, I really am delighted and certainly thank you for the invitation to, to come and talk to you all uh, about this topic, which is, you know, certainly something that none of us can avoid because we're all victims of the current pandemic. So today we're going to talk about what the challenges are of vaccine industrial scale map and manufacture in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and really there are kind of like three parts to my story, mainly because I was told that this, this is, while there are many bench scientists, this is actually quite a mixed audience as well. Um, so there were three things that I wanted to try and cover today. So one was a, a general topic about the challenges of vaccine development in general and how we try and adapt to a pandemic. The, the second was to try and talk a little bit about MSDs vaccines against COVID-19. And of course, for those of you who are, who are watching the news, you may realize that um, uh, Merck MSD actually has two vaccines in development uh, against COVID-19. And then the third bullet point was to try and understand the trade-offs between speed and long-term supply. Because when we really think about vaccine development and the challenges of vaccine development, it's really important to understand that this is a long process, right? Making vaccines is unlike making therapeutics or medicines against cancer or anyone else. And that's because the risk ratio that we associate with vaccines is very different, right? For an individual with a disease or with cancer, you already know what risk they've taken on. You already know that they suffer from a debilitating disease and such that without treatment, their life expectancy may be poor and if they need that treatment, then, you know, kind of extend the life expectancy. Uh, however, the, the problem, of course, with vaccines is that that risk ratio flips. You're about to give a medicinal product to an individual who is perfectly healthy. There's nothing wrong with them. And that then means that the burden that we have to ensure that the product that we give to those individuals causes no harm is extraordinarily high. And even higher is that burden, mainly because many of the vaccines that are administered are given to children. So, so what that means really in terms of the vaccine manufacturing process, or rather the vaccine development process, is that the time to develop a vaccine could be anywhere from seven to 12 years on average. And, and actually the truth is, even these timescales are pretty conservative. The, the truth is that developing a vaccine can take longer and longer somewhere because the easy targets have all been done. And so when we consider the, the stages of that vaccine manufacture uh, and development, we start with discovery where we try and identify what our antigen is. So what is the key component that will offer protection against that um, particular pathogen or disease? The second part of course is the preclinical work. So that's really in two forms. So one is once you've got a target that you think might be useful, you enter into preclinical development. So this is really what, what my area does. Uh, uh, we look at uh, developing the manufacturing process such that once our colleagues in discovery have come up with one dose, it's our job to try and create a manufacturing process that means that you can then develop millions of doses and make sure that they are effective uh, and also cost effective as well and affordable. And of course, tied in with that preclinical is the animal studies usually that occur as well, just to give us some indication that we think the vaccine is safe, we think the vaccine is effective. But, but of course, 
you know, animal studies will only give you so much information, which is why you then need to move into human trials. And typically that is in phases of one, two, and three. Uh, and it's really the human readout, both on safety and efficacy, that will give us the true understanding of whether or not this product is successful. Uh, and then if it is successful and meets that proof of concept point, so usually phase two, phase two clinical tri trials are our proof of concept point, then you know, we have the commitment into commercial manufacture uh, and licensure and marketing. The, the point is, is that we have this process that is stage gated because the cost associated with developing a vaccine and bring it to market is, is extensive, right? And so we can think of on the scales of half a billion to billions, uh, a, a billion dollars almost, or just shy of a billion dollars, if we consider the investment from discovery all the way through to commercial manufacture. And so, so that's what we're really doing with separating out the process is that at each point at discovery, preclinical, clinical, and, uh, uh, and, and really phase two clinical, we're trying to stage gate the process so we can limit the time, the effort, the investment, uh, and understand whether or not that this is a true product or whether or not we're in futility, given the scale of investment required. Of course, when we then think about a pandemic, all of that changes. The stage gating process, the risk mitigation process, everything that we associate with normal development timelines goes out of the window. Because of course, when we think about responding to a pandemic, responding on a time scale of years is unacceptable. Absolutely unacceptable because of course, even now as we're seeing, in the absence of an effective treatment or vaccine, it means that we have to undergo this quarantine. And of course, the longer that quarantine lasts, the compliance with measures to quarantine begin to break down. The public's perception and their risk associated with a particular disease begins to change. And with that breakdown in compliance, it means that being able to stem the pandemic becomes ever more difficult. Which is why in which case, with pandemics, speed is the key. So the discovery, development and release of a vaccine has to occur in months, not years, which really means that our stage gate approach means that we actually have all of the institutes of development of discovery, preclinical, clinical and commercial, all occurring at the same time. Because if we assume that we have a candidate that works, it means that you want to move to clinical trials as quickly as possible to try and demonstrate whether or not your vaccine is effective. But of course, standing up a commercial manufacturing facility, and in this particular case, manufacturing facilities, multiple facilities that can deal with a world or population demand, means that you need to start investing now. And that pre-investment has to begin even before you actually enter clinical. And in fact, that pre-investment has to begin in hand in hand as we're going through the discovery and preclinical development. So what we're really talking about is the risk profile changing such that we're at maximum risk. If this all works, of course, that risk can be mitigated and we think about, you know, getting a vaccine out to the market and being able to uh, deal with some of the risk profile. If it's not, of course, it means that companies that invest in this commercial manufacturing process, the capital investment, the facilities uh, and staging up this development, if the candidate fails, all of that investment is lost. But it's also worth pointing out that for companies like Merck and others, of course, such as GSK, Sanofi, there are other opportunity costs that are also lost as well, because you know, we have a very extensive portfolio of vaccines from dengue to CMV to, to, to others as well, and, and inline products, which means that when we shift our focus onto these candidates and they don't work, it means we're not working on those other candidates as well. And of course, they are all essential vaccines. They're all important disease candidates. So really, it's the level of pre-investment and being able to work at risk, which is the real challenge in terms of dealing with the speed component um, when we think about development here. So, so let me kind of pivot and talk a little bit about uh, MSD's vaccine candidates for COVID-19. So, so the first vaccine candidate that we have is actually a joint project between MSD 
and IAVI, which stands for the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. And, and really what we're doing there is we're using a candidate that we have a lot of experience with called VSV. So VSV stands for uh, vesicular stomatitis virus, uh, and it's actually a zoonotic disease. It's an animal pathogen, uh, kind of bullet shaped, as is drawn by the cartoon there, uh, and generally infects cattle, horses, and pigs. And, you know, it can infect humans, of course, uh, and when it does so, it usually produces very mild flu-like symptoms. But what we've actually done with VSV in collaboration with our partners at IAVI is that we've modified VSV and attenuated it such that we can actually change the glycoprotein coat that surrounds the virus. So I always love images. I, I actually love uh, pictures as much as possible. And so what we see here is an EM electromicrograph image uh, of the VSV virus right here. So you can see this nice long rod shape design here. But what you can also see here, are the glycoprotein brush that just exudes from the surface of the virus itself. And really what it is, is that it's, it's this red spike that you see this glycoprotein, a mixture of a surface protein that is sugared as well, that's glycoprotein, that, that there is then presented at the surface here. So under the normal wild type, this is what the normal VSV virus looks like. However, what we did in the case of Ebola is that we actually created a chimeric virus. So the idea of this virus was that let's modify the gene. So we changed the gene here for the glycoprotein. And in the case of Ebola back in um, 2014 or 2016, um, we, we actually inserted the glycoprotein for the Ebola Zaire strain, um, such that what we did is we created this chimeric virus, such that we still have the, the bullet shape and the main functionality of the VSV virus but the outside coat of glycoproteins is now being changed to look like Ebola. Uh, and of course, when it was administered to individuals, uh, certainly in, in the um, uh, West Africa outbreak uh, in 2016 that suffered in, in Guinea, Sierra Leone and, and uh, Liberia, this vaccine was demonstrated to be 97% effective. Uh, and of course, in the subsequent years in the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, in 2018, um, this vaccine, again, was used and licensed uh, for that outbreak as well. And uh, only recently now has been uh, successful in declaring an end to the outbreak uh, in the DRC. It's worth noting that this platform that we're using um, and the experience that we gained back in 2016 and 2018 is now being leveraged against SARS-CoV-2. So it's being leveraged against the coronavirus, such that, again, in a similar approach, what we're really doing is we're shifting out the gene for the glycoprotein and in this case putting the spike protein from SARS-CoV-2 uh, into the actual sequence itself such that the outside of the virus now looks a lot like uh, the SARS virus but of course the main functionality of the VSV virus backbone not lost. This vaccine is replication competent so of course what it means is that when you administer it into individuals, it, it will reproduce. But the idea behind that replication competency is that our true hope is, as we saw with Ebola, was that this vaccine was a single dose vaccine, such that you administer it once and it provides protective, efficacious immunization for, for multiple years. And certainly based on the data that we're seeing from the 2016 outbreak in West Africa, there seems to be a longer term persistence of protection uh, using the VSV virus itself uh, and this platform. So, so really what we hoped is that this is a platform technology that we should be able to use. And so, so really what we mean by platform technologies are rather than with each unique vaccine trying to reinvent the wheel each time and in doing so losing that speed, that time and, the, and that investment required, we want to try and leverage as much information as possible from the Ebola process in order to accelerate um, our COVID-19 uh, vaccine instead. In order to do so, it's worth pointing out that the, the Ebola vaccine itself, Abivo, uh, which of course is now licensed, used a, a very difficult manufacturing process. 
it uses a manufacturing process called roller bottle process. And essentially it can be divided uh, into two large set of steps. So the box in red are essentially the steps that we have for drug substance and the boxes in gray are the processes that we go through in terms of creating the drug product. So essentially it takes 45 days to expand the cells um, which will act as the substrate uh, for the virus in roller bottles. And each batch is around 400 roller bottles. We then infect with a seed amount of virus each roller bottle. And of course, it's a pretty manual handling process there. Um, and then after two, three days, we harvest the supernatant from each bottle and pool. We add an enzyme in there in order to try and break down some of the nucleic acid in there. Uh, and then go through the steps of purification in a very similar process to the one that Susanna uh, had outlined before. And then we store the drug, sub, sub, then we store the main bulk drug substance at, at around minus 60 degrees Celsius. And then when it comes to fill finish, we can then defrost this, go through the fill finish process, which of course is just uh, decamp, uh, uh, formulating into the final buffer, uh, undergoing that fill finish process of uh, putting a set amount of the dose into a vial, uh, stopper, capping it, inspect, label, and then package, and then ship at minus 60. It's worth pointing out, and this is where we slightly change from what Susanna had talked about, is that there's no 0.2 micron filter here. So what that means is that there's, there's, there's no sterile filter that means that we can then uh, ensure that um, the, the sterility, if, if there should be a lack of sterility somewhere, that we can reduce the bio burden with that 0.2 micron filter. So, so what this process is, is actually it's a closed process um, that is handled aseptically to ensure that no bacteria or other, other uh, contaminants can enter the process itself. Now, uh, you know, the, the Abella story, of course, is a great story, not just for Merck, but for global human health as well, in responding to a, a critical outbreak in, in Africa. But there were some problems with that platform process, certainly uh, some problems that we experienced with uh, the Bivo Ebola process, and mainly because that we were trying to respond, again, at speed and in time um, to that outbreak, such that, you know, trying to come up with a vaccine and distributing it every single day mattered greatly. And so while the roller bottle process itself gave us speed because essentially what we were doing is we were taking a lab-based process and advancing that, there were limitations, right? And, and, and I guess the biggest limitation was the drug substance itself had to be frozen and shipped at minus 60 degrees Celsius. And, and the reason for that is that when you, when you advance at such speed, you're really shortchanging the time that is required for drug product formulation. And thus, it, it really wasn't possible back then to, to look at extending that shelf life. And even the two to eight shelf life, you know, was only stable for, for about four weeks. But, but the biggest issue that we had really with the roller bottle process is that it's not a flexible, scalable system. Right. And so for those unfamiliar with roller bottles, this is what it looks like. This, this is a roller bottle. It'll have a working volume um, of around half a litre, 500 mils. The cells line the inside of this bottle and essentially these bottles then put on racks like this that rotate and maintain the temperature. And so you can see it's, it's, it's a very labour intensive and uh, a not very scalable system. Uh, and so what we're doing with uh, our SARS-CoV-2 press is that because we do have the roller bottle experience, um, for our phase one material, we're actually generating that material in roller bottles because for phase one, you need a relatively small amount of material as well. Um, but because we do have that experience, we know what the process looks like. We're again, using that platform technology, that leveraging that platform technology to try and advance that process uh, as quickly as possible into phase one clinical trials. But we know when it comes to commercial supply and certainly global supply for the world that roller bottles aren't going to cut it because they're just not scalable. And so at the same time, what we're also doing is developing a second generation process in a bioreactor system that, of course, is far more scalable and thus should be able to meet the supply demands um, for either of our vaccine candidates. The second candidate, of course, uh, is our Themis measles vector candidate. And so Themis uh, has been recently acquired by Merck. Um, and what they have again here is 
uh, a measles vectored vaccine. So here's, here's a nice little image of the measles virus. Uh, many of you may have been already immunized with the measles vaccine or certainly with an NMR vaccine, of which of course uh, is measles. And the idea of this vaccine is that what you can do is in a similar way or a similar fashion to the VSV vaccine is that you can insert the genome for the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein into the measles genome itself, such that this now becomes a vectored vaccine and that vector or the transgene the vector itself carries uh, is that spike protein for SARS-CoV-2. And so again, this is a very similar technology to the one that we're using with VSV in the sense that it is a live, attenuated, but replication competent virus. Um, and so again, with that replication competency, what we're looking for is that longer term immunity and, and hopefully that it be single dose as well. Um, in terms of the demonstration of this particular vaccine platform, um, the company Themis that we've now recently acquired as part of MST Merck, um, they've actually demonstrated this, vac uh, this vector on several vaccine candidates. So chikungunya, Zika, uh, Noro, CMV, uh, Lassa fever and MERS, which of course is another form of coronavirus um, ha has already been demonstrated and funded uh, in order to show some principle in animal studies. Uh, and again, we're now working to try and advance this candidate as well uh, as the VSV candidate. The, the rationale behind both of them is that because they are live attenuated vaccines, they should be replication competent, the, the single dose vaccines. Um, the hope of course with the Themis measles vaccine is that um, because most people have had an MMR or measles vaccine, that this vaccine may be much more tolerable uh, when injected into humans. So now moving toward like the, the third and final part, um, and that's really the trade-off between speed and, and the long-term approach. Uh, and really when we think about you know, dealing or responding to a pandemic, um, it's so uncertain what we need to try and manufacture because really we need to invest in commercial manufacturing right now, especially if we want to have the aim of producing billions of doses and recognize that companies like Merck don't have spare capacity. We usually design our capacity for a particular product in mind. So, so in doing that, we also almost instantly need to try and understand, you know, what, what is the target product profile of this vaccine? You know, what is the shelf life? What is a dose? Will this be one dose versus two doses versus multiple doses? Because of course that then that means that the amount of stainless steel or in terms of bar reactors that we invest in creating all of the doses and drug substance begins to change. But there's also other elements with the pandemic such as this that are, are unknown to us, right? And, and I guess the, the number one issue is how long will the pandemic last? And actually will we transition from a pandemic state where we deal with the initial response to an endemic state, because of course, this coronavirus will now be one of the more common circulating coronaviruses around the world. And so does this now look a little bit like influenza instead of seasonal influenza? I, I don't think it will. And, and we can certainly in the Q&A uh, come on to that as well. But really what it means is that as you invest in these facilities, how long are they going to be producing this vaccine? And certainly when we think of vaccines, we think of life cycles of 20, 30 or, or 40 years time, and, and in certain cases, 50. Certainly MMR we've now been producing over 50 years. Is it true that we will be producing this vaccine for over 50 years? It's, it's very questionable. It's very questionable. And certainly when we think about even the speed at which we respond, when we engage with regulatory agencies, one thing is absolutely key that the quality of the vaccine itself must not be compromised, right? And so while we've seen that platform technology, of course, can try and help to accelerate, there are always some, certain, uh, some things that you, you can't shortchange on. And of course, as I said, drug product formulation is one of those issues that means that we have to balance that speed with the long-term success. Luckily, of course, with many regulatory agencies, there is flexibility to provide shelf life data post-approval. So even if we don't have the right drug product formulation right now, depending on how long this vaccine will be supplied, we do have the opportunity to go back and try and fix that and extend the shelf life as and when required. 
there are also different routes of access. And many people, when you read it in the newspapers or, or whatever your media format is, talk about emergency use or emergency authorization to use these vaccines as quickly as possible. And so when we think about emergency use and where that comes in, so emergency use authorization generally comes in before you grant a license for the vaccine. So it's the pre-licensure space. However, emergency use can only be used after you have demonstrated efficacy uh, of your vaccine. So it's a very small window that emergency use authorization can actually be used. And, and, and actually the truth is, certainly when we look at our experience from Ebola, that emergency use authorization actually isn't that helpful at all. Um, and, and the reason it's not that helpful is that um, because in many cases there's such, such uh, a demand or requirement to try and get the vaccine licensed as quickly as possible, getting through all of the paperwork associated with emergency use and recognize that each country has very different requirements for emergency use as well, which can also be very difficult to navigate, means that you actually may as well just move straight forward to licensure rather than bothering with emergency use. And, and the truth is that in many cases, emergency use authorization actually isn't required, right? And so certainly when we think about our experience with the Ebola outbreak in West Africa and the DRC, what we actually did is that because we'd already set up the protocols in country for clinical trials, right? And so that's essentially what was happening before emergency use could come up because we were still running phase two, three trials in those particular territories. You can still immunize people without requiring emergency use because you just extend the clinical protocol instead um, so, such that you can then treat those individuals. So it does require you to talk to each individual and get that informed consent, but that is good practice anyway. So uh, it's, it's questionable how useful emergency use is. But one thing certainly is clear and that, you know, when we deal with these types of pandemics and we try and respond as, as best as possible, that there is an incredible need for international collaboration. I say that because no single vaccine manufacturer is gonna be able to supply a population of 7 billion people or over 7 billion people. That's, that's just not realistic. No one company has that kind of capacity. And certainly even in terms of our estimates where we are planning for you know, hundreds of millions of doses and crossing into billions, you know, our best estimates still assume that there will be other companies that will, will be successful and also have vaccines on the market. And actually, this is a unique situation in the sense that we don't see ourselves truly in competition, but, but really it has to be slightly co cooperative and um, because it's essential that we have multiple candidates that are on the market in order to make sure that when the vaccines are developed, that they get to those people who need them the most as well. Um, but of course, there, there is an increased risk, right? Because where we don't know anything about these diseases when they first come out. And in terms of the candidates that we try and develop, um, we, we try and do so at speed and at risk, which means that when we want to try and think about trying to defer some of that risk, you know, finding novel pathways of funding are always important. And certainly we've been lucky enough to get some BADA funding as well from the US government. Uh, and of course, many of the other vaccine candidates that you hear in the media, they also have different sources of funding. Uh, and CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, is one of the major funders uh, that deals with that. Um, but, but also what we see is that, you know, there is a need for harmonized regulation because, as I say, like every country is different and every rule is different as well, which means that when you want to try and get a vaccine out as quickly as possible, having to deal with over 140 different regulatory documents is, is not helpful. And so go operating through organizations like the WHO to try and standardize those harmonize and harmonize those regulations is extremely important. Um, and, and I guess, you know, thinking a little more about, you know, how COVID-19, certainly in the US and Europe, uh, has also slightly been politicized as well. Right. We, we also need protocols for access such that it shouldn't be about countries that can shout the loudest um, that they get access to the vaccines, but really based on need. And certainly the U.S. Is, is, is one of those. It also turns out that based on the latest infection curves, the U.S. also might be the country with the greatest need to be based on those infection curves. But, but certainly this is something that companies don't want to get involved in. I mean, they would much rather have 
uh, a unitary authority like the WHO or something else that tells them and says, look, th this is where these vaccines need to go. And, and we're actually very happy to work in partnership with those international uh, agencies to ensure that uh, access is achieved uh, in the most equitable manner. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, hopefully that's given you a little bit of uh, information in terms of uh, certainly our vaccine candidates uh, and uh, you know, some of the challenges that we have in trying to respond to this pandemic and some of the lessons that we learned uh, from the Ebola outbreak as well. Uh, and I'd be very happy to take uh, some of your questions. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jared. And we have some questions. Yeah, we clap. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> your Professor Parvis is, yeah. So Parvis, <laughs> If you could help me and Carlos as well, if you could help me administer the questions for Tarek because they are coming through the chat box. Yeah. Yes, yes. go ahead. To... This, this was excellent, Tarek. Congratulations. Well done. Thank, well, you. Yeah. Thank you. very much. So we have a question here coming from Karina Paskevich. Karina is in our vaccine and adjuvants team here at UNSAM. Yeah, they are working hard. They've been in the lab today. I've, I've met with them earlier or yesterday. I met with them and uh, they are working hard. And so the question Karina is asking to Tarit is like this. Why did you focus only in attenuated genetic modified virus platforms and not in subunit vaccine that may be safer regarding the short time to test toxicity? Long-term safety is a concern? Yeah, I mean, so, so that's a great question. So, so we focused on viral vaccine platforms mainly because uh, of two things. So, so we feel at Merck that, you know, viral vaccines is really one of our core strengths. And, and actually, when you look at our vaccine portfolio, you'll see that uh, almost 60-70% of the vaccines that we manufacture are, are viral vaccines. And so we do, we do focus on that. And, and that is something that we have an enormous amount of experience in. The, the second reason, and, and this actually probably goes to closer to the, the core of the question, is that um, we're very much more interested in a single dose administration. We want one shot and that one shot to be protected. And we think that when we compare that to subunit vaccines, certainly protein subunit vaccines, that many of these va subunit vaccines require two doses uh, or more. Right? And, and our worry is is not... Um, developed world markets where it's usually better in terms of the enforcement of having some return for a second shot, right? Our, our think is actually the global market where, you know, someone comes up for one dose, can you guarantee six weeks later they'll come up for their second dose follow-up, right? Uh, and also, you know, when we think about, um, when we think about that, that market as well and, you know, simply like the cues, the lines that will form to try and get access to this, right? Having one dose is incredibly important. And, and the third consideration I'd say is that, you know, when we think about dose and volume of reactor required and the sheer volumes required to try and manufacture enough doses, we go down the route of subunit vaccines, that's far larger than a live virus vaccine because the dose size are generally smaller. Secondly, if you need uh, a second uh, dose, of course, it means the volumes you have to produce will double as well. So the, these are the multiple considerations that we had, which is why with both of our investments, we've, we've actually chosen recombinant viruses. Great answer to a great question. I have Juliana here, Juliana Casataro. She's a, the principal investigator in this group that works with adjuvants and vaccine. I was telling you, uh, Tarit, about it. They, they won uh, brands from Lina, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, etc. And Juliana says, great talk. And she, she works in oral delivery. So this uh, question is not unexpected from her because that's okay. her subject, yeah? And she says, do you think that IgA at the gut could have a role on SARS-CoV-2 infection? <sighs> wow. Uh <laughs> Yeah. She's an expert and she's an immunologist, so be, be careful with what you answer. Yeah. Because <laughs> throw you tomatoes over the screen and they will get... <laughs> yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, the truth is, it's, it's, listen, it's, it's, it's a great question. And, and certainly in terms of the role of IgA within the mucosal immunity uh, is, is important. Do, do I know or do I feel that that's going to be important in terms of the gut immunity? Uh, I, I don't know. 
right? And, and, I'm, and I'm not sure we do know. However, what I will say, and simply because the interest is in oral vaccines, is that the, the VSV platform that we're using, so, so one of the routes of administration that we're looking at actually is oral administration, right? And, and this is really based on a paper that was published by the Public Health Authority of Canada, where, which is in fact where we license the VSV platform from. Um, for the Ebola outbreak is that they conducted a study in non-human primates um, where they actually had the same VSV virus that we used as part of IM delivery, but, um, but they used it for OM instead. In fact, um, uh, administered sublingua, and, and the idea was that what you should do is actually put it in the mouth, swirl it around, um, uh, and then swallow. And it was thought that actually it's, it's the mucosa within the actual nasal, well, the, the mouth itself, or the mouth mucosa, oral mucosa, which actually is effective enough for the uptake of the, of the vaccine itself. And so as part of our studies, we will be looking for VSV, whether or not an oral delivery in a similar fashion uh, will be useful. The, the reason we're not looking at gut, uh, because one of, the, one of the issues, of course, is gastric buffering, um, which we experienced with the rotor and we're worried about the damage to the actual dose itself. But, you know, based on that experience, that non-human primate study, if oral administration, you know, via the mouth and just mixing it around in the mouth uh, is, is useful, and of course that, that could be very beneficial. Okay, Tari, uh, Pavis, do you have a question? You no, are I, I, I just wanted to echo, can, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 we can. I just wanted to echo everything that Tarit said and also add that I, it's my, in my humble view that uh, it also could have something to do with what we call bioavailability. You know that uh, the bioavailability through direct injections and, and so on is 100%. Any other route, any other route would be a fraction of that. And what that means is that the dose has to go up. If you're giving a, a, a vaccine, like any other therapeutic, by any, any other biotherapeutic, by a route other than direct injection, either, uh, you know, sub-Q or into IV, you have to increase the dose significantly. And as Tarit said, if we have problem in terms of manufacturing the doses, for direct injection, just imagine what the challenge is if you go down other, other delivery routes. I, I don't know whether I made that uh, clear, but bioavailability is a big question here. Yeah, uh, Juliana may, may say that if you use one of her adjuvants, which are immunostimulators that will go with the antigen, you could reduce the dose, yeah? And I'm sure she will make an... Uh, when we <laughs> Look, I'm going to introduce you, Juliana, and she's very passionate about what she does with oral delivery, and she will convince you that yeah. oral delivery is the way. By okay. the way, again... Oh, please, Juliana, have a look. Yeah, hello, Juliana. <laughs> but hello. by the way, this is the reason, I, I just want to add again to everybody, Tarisa, this is the reason why this whole area of vaccine development man, is going to really play a significant role. One thing COVID has done is to change everybody's view and approach. So research is going to intensify, process development is going to intensify. Every, some people are talking about this becoming a trillion dollar industry for the, for the biopharmaceuticals. So it's a big deal. It's a lot of research to be done. Good. I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Parvis is also my incredible, uh, my PR agent as well. So, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, uh, Tari, tell tell us how abandoned you felt when Parvis left. He, he, hasn't, he still hasn't forgiven me. Oh, no, no, no. I never forget. I never forget. <laughs> Okay, so any other question? I think there was a question from Susana Larando. She, she was asking how big should be the population you should test for efficacy, numbers in the trials, number of people that you should immunize to make sure yeah. something safe. So, so that, I mean, that, that, that's a great question. And, and a great question in the sense that it, it kind of also depends on the local infection rate as well. 
right? And so, so generally, if the infection rate is higher, you can have a smaller study size population. Uh, if, if the infection itself is waning in the territory that you're looking at, then generally you have to increase the study size population. But, but, it, but in very general terms, like if you want to demonstrate safety, you're, you, could be in, you could be in numbers as, as, as small as in, in the 50, 50 to 60 people, right? And, and that very much, and that very much de demonstrates whether or not you have a platform process, right? And so, so I say that for certainly VSV in the sense that, um, you know, you, you can have a study arm that's as small as that, mainly because what we're saying is that with the experience that we have with Ebola uh, and that VSV platform, but in terms of once we establish the biodistribution and how that uh, wanes in, in you know, animal studies, but also when we look at the safety profile that's generated in a limited human population as well, if that looks similar, then again, having a smaller population size uh, could, could suffice. But, but generally, if you don't have that, if you can't leverage a platform process or a platform vaccine, then, then the truth is you're, you're probably going to be in the hundreds of people. In terms of demonstrating efficacy and certainly something like uh, this disease, you know, our, our current thinking is in the tens of thousands. Uh, and, and, that's, and that's really what we're planning for. We're planning for uh, different arms, but we're in the tens of thousands of people. Hmm. Right, good. And then uh, I have another question. Can you tell us why and how on earth you wrote that paper on April 2019 about a pandemic situation, you know, the Rebium vaccine. Which one? The last I showed in April 2019, you showed yeah. this paper with the Home Office talking yeah. about a, a pandemic scenario. Did you have any hint of what was going to come? <laughs> Do you, so, what, was I clairvoyant or something? Yeah. <laughs> no, so, so, so listen, so, so I've, I've been... Uh, working in vaccines for some time and, and actually been privileged enough to be invited to certain uh, subject matter group experts uh, and, and I'm considered one of them. So um, I, I was invited to the WHO's uh, working group on pathogen X, where we were trying to think about how it would be best to try and respond to pandemics. Um, during my time in the UK and, you know, I, well, while I was a professor at University College London, I, I wasn't just a professor. I was also um, the chair for one of the working groups for the UK Vaccine Network, which was, a, which was a government institution that was really set up to try and understand what the limitations are in, in responding to a pandemic. So, so I mean, for, for me, um, this has actually been a topic of interest for me uh, ever since 2009 with the swine flu pandemic. And, and back then, I, I just started my career as an academic. And indeed, as, as Susanna pointed out, Peter... Uh, Peter Dunhill, who um, unfortunately is no longer with us now, but, but I mean, he and I worked very closely in terms of thinking about uh, the response to that, that swine flu pandemic. Now, in the end, um, you know, the good news was that, that that pandemic was not as bad as people thought it might be. But all the questions, all the uncertainties, and all the institutional gaps that we saw then are still true today. And so part of my work was to try and close those gaps or at least increase the preparedness that countries uh, or organizations have in actually trying to respond to these pandemics. The, the good news is that we're, we're not, I mean, the, the, and, and sorry, the, the, the truth is we're not there yet. Uh, and of course, when we look around and we see face masks and we see the lockdown that we're in, we're, we're no longer there, right? But the needle, the good news is that the needle is moving in the right direction because institutions like SETI, the Coalition for, Pan, uh, for Emergency Preparedness uh, Innovations. You know, th this is kind of like a, an independent organization that has multiple funders who are putting money in, and their job is to try and increase the global preparedness against pandemics, right? That is, that is exactly their job. Now, unfortunately, uh, SEPI was only established a few years ago. I think I think they've only been in operation for now for three years or two years, right? And so I feel that if this pandemic were to have hit later on, like, and SEPI had the time to establish themselves and had like 10 years, uh, I think the response would be very different, right? But what we are seeing is that certainly internationally, this is now a topic that previously was gaining traction, but of course now that 
you have the experience that's going to change hearts and minds. And I think that that will accelerate further. We're now also seeing, you know, the UK government and other governments across the world uh, uh, investing specifically in vaccines uh, to deal with that pandemic preparedness. And whether we have like strategic stockpiles versus national stockpiles, uh, that they're all policy questions that are, that are in discussion. But, but certainly, uh, I think as we're living through it, it's an extremely important topic. Yeah. And we have here Ju Wei, who's joining Oh, listen to that, Ju yeah. Wei. Ju Wei was one of your students back then in London, so can you read his question? Or Ju Wei, you can switch on your video because you, are, you woke up so early. Come on, switch on your video, we see how you look like early in the morning. Jubei is now working with Takeda vaccines and he said they have a dengue vaccine. I, I don't know who they are. I don't know who they are. Yeah, <laughs> Takeda is coming up with a vaccine against dengue. Jubei is okay. telling me. Can you see you, Jubei? I'm sitting in my living room with the lights off. Uh, <laughs> so, Harvis, can you read Jubei's question? Well, no, he's, he switches only no, one. No, I don't, there's nothing typed. Yeah, he said the question. Oh, oh, I see. A trillion dollar COVID-19 industry, uh, yeah, is rich pickings for criminals, he says. <laughs> could, you, uh, could you speak to the anti-counterfeit? Well, that's a good question. Measures um, that can be implemented to protect patients. Yeah, so, yeah, this is an interesting security, yeah, counterfeit, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, so in terms of many of the anti-counterfeit measures that there are, right, that's, that's dealt with the packaging and the labeling yeah. that we have there, right? So, so in terms of what the vial should look like, the, yeah. the labeling, the instructions that come with it, that, that's all part of the anti-counterfeit measures yeah. that are. The, the, the truth is that, you know, we're, we're kind of like rushing this at, at, at well, at, at warp speed, not to kind of like coin the, the government phrase that's being used right now. Um, so, so in terms of those anti-counterfeit measures, um, right now in terms of the clinical supply, they're kind of linked in by the, the fact that the stock is controlled by those healthcare professionals. Um, but again, in terms of the longer term, the anti-counterfeit measures, I mean, some we actually disclose in terms of the, the labeling, the imaging that's used and, and what the vial should look like. And there are other security measures that, that we generally don't talk about. Um, yeah. But you know, as we go through they will be implemented in the commercial supply. And I, I would just, again, echo everything that, that uh, Tariq says. And from my own days at Lilly, I know most of these, all of these, certainly big companies, have significant or dedicate significant resources to uh, making sure that they can actually intercept and, and deal with counterfeiting. It goes on. It isn't unique to... Uh, vaccines, I can assure you. I mean, they do, this thing goes on all the time. And big companies spend a, a lot of resources trying to deal with it. And, and my assumption, Ji Wei, with your question is that, you know, the, when the vaccine comes out, it will immediately be in short supply. Yes, because for sure. The yeah. risk and the ability to counterfeit and then con people out of taking something that looks like a vaccine, but of course isn't and not protected will be extremely high. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Mm. Okay. So one thing we do in these seminars, which is, this is the first international seminar. I hope it's clear for you now that it's such now, oh, and it's, go, it's going to be very hard to set up the next one. We do this <laughs> once a month, but then with this speaker and the audience we have today, it's going to be very, very, and then I have my boss there, Carlos Fresh there, <laughs> He always says, then you do something okay, then you should do better. So now I'm kind of panicking what <laughs> we're going to do next month. If anyone in the audience has any suggestion, very, very welcome. And then I think one of the things we do is that we keep this just on time so people have appetite to meet us in a month's time, yeah, not to get bored. So I thank everyone for joining us today. It's been really a pleasure. And we'll see you in uh, four weeks. And um, any suggestion for new topics, please do write me. <laughs> OK. OK, thank you very much for coming. And I'm going to switch my screen off now. Thank you. Bye.
Right. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye, Tari. See you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. See you, Pavel. See you. Yeah. Bye. See you. Hey, Tari. See you soon. So yeah, much. Work. Thank you, Tari, so much for joining us. Yeah. And then um, I'm going to, I was um, Juliana Casacharo. I will introduce her to you, you know. So we Hello. talk about her her adjuvants, which are very interesting because she's an immunologist. And so this IgA question she was asking, she knows all about uh, what uh, mucosal um, immune response means and so on. Yeah. yeah. And then thank you very, very much, Tarit. And we'll see you soon. Okay. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs>